Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, David Christensen from Endpoint Corporation, as was just introduced. Uh, my talk today is going to be on choosing a logical replication system uh, and some of the issues that, uh, and considerations that go into that. A lot of this is going to go into the design of the specifics here, and we're going to be talking a lot about the kind of the historical stuff rather than kind of the upcoming things, although I will touch on that briefly. I just want to say also that my day started out winning a $100 bottle of scotch, so it's downhill from here. Uh, I will be raffling off a Red Bull, though, no, if you guys want to pay attention. So. Um, so first of all, let's talk about just replication in general. Um, is there one right choice for a replication system? And the answer to this is no. You know, if you were expecting anything different, any silver bullet, um, still time to go to another talk, sorry to disappoint. Uh, it's just simply a matter of understanding the constraints and applying engineering decisions. Man. Uh, so replication is, of course, used for many reasons. It's used for disaster recovery. It's used for high availability and failover, read and write scaling, backups. Those are a lot of common reasons for doing this. I think probably nobody at this conference has to be told why you would replicate data. Um, but of course, there are you know, two choices here. There's log logical and physical replication. And the big question is, why would we need logical replication systems when we've got all this great Postgres built-in native replication using the physical uh, wall streaming? Well, uh, logical replication supports differing hardware and Postgres versions. So um, as you probably know, the physical replication requires the exact same version of Postgres uh, because the wall records need to be the same format. Uh, the system catalogs need to be the same, so there's an, an inherent um, tie there between the, the types of uh, the systems that can be involved. Um, with physical replication, um, you have to replicate the entire database system. You cannot choose, pick and choose certain tables that you'd like to do. Uh, depending on your application, this, this may be something that you, you care about strongly. There may be a few tables that you need to kind of purpose-driven you know, replicate to other systems, and uh, you don't worry so much about all the other tables. Uh, so particularly in these sort of heterogeneous uh, systems, that's, that's a consideration. And uh, writable clusters on the slave. Of course, with physical replication, the uh, slaves are all, you know, you cannot write on those. So it basically, you have one master that you write to. That's the only thing that can be done to that data. Um, and so there's kind of a single point of, of contention there. Uh, and of course, you know, the reality is that not everyone is running the latest and greatest systems. So even as we move forward, uh, you know, we still have clients that are running, you know, 8.2 or 8.3, uh, different systems where we can't rely on, on things being available, all the functionality and features being available. So logical replication will give us an opportunity to kind of have some of the benefits of, of replication without having to, uh, you know, We'll still try to get them upgraded, but you know that's ultimately their decision. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about physical replication. Um, of course, this started out with Worm Standby uh, back in the, the early eights. Um, we went to Hot Standby in nine. Um, the physical, of course, comes from duplicating the actual disk structure. Uh, so if you have a, a, a replica on one system, it literally will have, once it's caught up to a certain point in the wall replay, it'll have the exact same on disk structure for all of the data. Uh, so Postgres core applications built upon its recovery system and uh, basically will make all of the same changes. Um, it's kind of, I, I, I have to assume, one of the great design uh, advances that, that Postgres made, just being able to use this, and I really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, it started out warm, uh, standby, was better than nothing, management's very primitive, you had to manually create backups. Uh, using you know some of the PG start X logs functions, which is of course a pain. Uh, you know you have your 16 meg wall files that were generated by default. So this data ended up um, basically your your recovery choices are you can set an archive timeout and have you know uh, potentially non-filled data segments, uh, which which would speed up the recovery process or ensure that if you did lose data it was minimal. Um, but those were, were very, fairly primitive. Of course, in Postgres 9, we got hot standby, streaming replication, which really reduced a lot of the latency things there. 
We can query our, our uh, standby servers. We're never too far behind if we're using streaming. And uh, later advances with cascading replication. Uh, 9.4 brought big changes with the logical decoding. We'll cover this some more, um, which is kind of the overlap between physical and logical replication. So. Of course, the benefits of physical replication, it's easy to set up and use now. You know, just use PG-based backup, do something like that, create a, a replica really easily. There's a lot of other tools that are available uh, in the community where people have, have had uh, things to, to really sweeten the deal as far as working with, with physical replicas. Um, this also supports synchronous replication, I think, as of 9.1. Uh, it's ideal for high availability and read scaling. You know, you know, any DDL, DML changes, everything is automatically propagated because all the rights to the system catalogs are propagated as well. So those are definitely benefits. Uh, there are limitations, of course, to the physical replication. It requires, as I said before, the same Postgres versions, hardware architecture, standby servers, read-only, no local changes at all. And every change in the entire cluster is replicated. So you cannot replicate a subset of tables or databases. Uh, that can be somewhat limiting. Uh, depending on your use cases. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about logical replication uh, features that were introduced in 9.4. Um, I, I imagine we'll be talking about some of these uh, in this upcoming talk. I'm looking forward to the BDR talk, so a little pre-pump up there. Uh, there were some big changes introduced in, for the logical replication system in Postgres 9.4. We introduced logical log decoding which uh, works via parsing the, the wall stream and extracting all the information about modified tuples. So if you change some data, uh, you, you insert a record, you uh, delete a record, those, those tuples are all, that information is all you know, stored in the wall stream and the, the new infrastructure in Postgres 9.4 enables you to write or to utilize programs to uh, extract that data out into a format that you can use. So of course, there's new postgres.conf settings. There's the wall level logical, which is kind of the highest wall level now, um, but that's, that's required. You also have to set your max replication slots in order to do anything useful. Uh, replication slots themselves, um, basically in order to have these uh, wall stream changes, we need to make sure that there's sort of a semi-permanent way to keep track of what clients are available when, uh, and that's kind of the what replication slots end up doing for us. Um, it's basically a, a, a way of keeping track of a wall location. You have um, a specific name, uh, sort of a token that, that uh, is assigned and that will, will be created and even pre uh, preserve over you know, system restarts, things like that. It ensures there's consistency. It ensures wall, cycle, or wall files don't get recycled. Um, and so basically, you get to set a, a spot and you know, read events. Uh, it's like a kind of a, a built-in queue that uh, uses the wall stream for its, its source. Uh, so slots are created and managed via the replication protocol. You can also use PG receive logical uh, program in the binary directory to do that. And of course, there's some SQL functions. If you're wanting to create you know, replication slots, there's an invocation here. Uh, you can see that you specify the slot with the slot argument, the database, and then the, the action create slot uh, to drop slots. It's the same except with drops, or the drop slot option. And then uh, you just indicate start, and that program will start up. So um, there's also SQL function equivalents. Uh, so you can call this from within Postgres itself rather than kind of externally, which I think could open itself up to some interesting applications. Um, the, the one difference here is you have the option to peak the changes. Uh, so basically, you can kind of see things that are upcoming. Uh, any of the changes that, that are, are pending can then you know, not be consumed, but maybe use that information to decide who's actually going to consume that data is one thing that comes up to mind. Uh, so in order to use this, we have uh, what are known as output plugins. And basically, the wall has to be decoded. So this is the job of an output plugin, because no one output is going to be um, sensible enough for every tool. So we want to basically allow people to have programs that will, will parse this data out and generate something useful. Um, you can provide that in the PC, or PG receive logical option with the plugin option, uh, which is essentially a piece of, of code that's written and uh, will be loaded as, as an output module. 
Um, so that's, of course, great for, for things looking forward. There's a lot of infrastructure here. There's a lot of things that will be interesting and good and useful for developing new logical replication systems. And that's really great for people who are on 9.4 and future versions. Uh, clients still are paying the bills. They need things done yesterday. They don't want to, can't upgrade. Uh, so, and even if they were on 9.4 today, that's not an entire solution. You know, there, there are tools that need to be written, things to be adapted. So it's a great infrastructure. It's a great way to start. But uh, we're still looking for um, you know, real realities of, of engineering. So let's talk about logical replication for now. Basically, uh, kind of reviewing some of the, the stuff we talked about before with logical replication that's fundamentally just capturing the logical changes that you make to the database as opposed to the physical changes. So it's, it's the table that you make a change to, it's the columns that you change, and it's the type of, of action that occurs. You have the insert, update, delete. Those are all things that will change. Um, and essentially, most ro logical replication systems will, will propagate these changes. In general, they work with triggers uh, on the tables to record any changes and some sort of daemon to propagate any of the changes to the intended nodes. Uh, it's inherently asynchronous in nature, um, which in general I would also say is, is fairly expected. Most people will not need synchronous, and you're probably using the wrong system if you're, you're trying to do this with these tools with that requirement. Um, so yeah, traditionally, this has been done with trigger-based systems such as Sloney, Bicardo, and Londist. We're going to cover Sloney and Bicardo in a little depth here through the rest of this talk. How am I doing on time? Great. OK, so some of the benefits of logical replication. Uh, it runs on different architectures and Postgres versions. Um, you can replicate a subset of database changes, specific tables, sequences, et cetera. The database clusters themselves are still writable. So for instance, you could have a separate database uh, that is not part of this replication set, and it would itself be writable. You could still use it for other things, um, which particularly if you're working with an existing installation can be, be very good. Um, and of course, there are also some limitations when it comes to logical replication. You know, the, the systems that are, are out there, you need to kind of specify replication explicitly. What gets, what gets replicated, uh, you know, how it gets replicated. If new tables are created, they're not automatically added. Uh, it requires more planning. Again, oh man. Uh, also, there's special handling for DDL or structural changes. So, you know, most systems out there are not able to just automatically take changes to the table structures and automatically you know, detect that and apply that. So there's, at the very least, some coordination there that has to be done. Um, and then it also requires a daemon or an external process to monitor and manage, which, of course, is another moving part. It's another thing that could break. So. Uh, let's talk some specifics, though. We'll look here. Uh, we're going to look at Sloney and Picardo and uh, briefly at BDR. So there's a little matrix I kind of put together. Um, we have kind of the master-slave uh, type of replication, which all the systems support. We have multi-master option, which Picardo and BDR support. Uh, custom conflict resolution, again, not relevant for Sloney because there's only one source of changes. And the other two systems uh, have, have that. Custom data transforms is a feature that uh, Picardo itself has. Uh, I don't remember if I get into this or not. Uh, multiple replication groups, uh, non-Postgres target databases, et cetera. Um, and then cascaded and, and custom topologies. So Sloney uh, was a system that was designed explicitly for single master, multiple slave replication. So that is its intent, and that's what it does. And it does a very good job at that. Um, uh, we have kind of our base anatomy here of a Sloney system, where you can see that we have a number of nodes, where each node is essentially a database. Um, within those nodes, you have sets. And within the sets are tables, where basically the tables are the things that are, are replicated, of course, sequences too, but I didn't include those. Uh, each node has its own Sloan daemon. Uh, that's the little green item there. Um, and then there's a Sloanic program, program. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, that effectively is what communicates with the, the, the Sloan daemons in order to manipulate uh, the cluster, make changes to things. Uh, so in this example cluster that I've got here, we've got two nodes. We've got uh, two sets and two tables in each set. So 
as this example here shows, you can see the replication proceeding via the set. So it, all the tables in a set are replicated together effectively. You can have a different origin node for each set. So you can see that on the first node, we've got the red set, and the second node, we've got the blue set. And effectively, even though they live in the same database, they are two separate, you know, two separate uh, groups of, of replicated tables. So th that's kind of a brief overview. I'll go into some more detail on each of these. Um, covered a lot of the nomenclature just now. We've got a path, of course, which is uh, basically the DSN to connect from one node to another. Now, depending on how complex your, your Sloney cluster is, you know, this, this basically will, will be a method for each one to get you know, IP address, host name, database name, uh, you know, that, that's that information. Um, at its core, Sloney is a distributed serialized event system. Uh, its internals are stored inside a Sloney schema in each node's database, and it contains all the support functions, triggers, et cetera, needed for the database level part of Sloney. Uh, Sloan daemon runs for each node, listening for and processing events. Each, each node has its own event queue, so it's not a coordinated queue across each node. So each node is able to send and receive and independently confirm its own events. Uh, with all the other nodes. And in general, the Sloan uh, communication is, is done via Slonic, uh, which has its own domain-specific language for creating all these events and distributing them across the cluster. Um, this one here appears to more or less be a duplicate of that, but uh, yeah, uh, effectively, let's see. With a Slon daemon, you, you generally will run that on the same machine as the database, but that's not a requirement. You can run that on any machine that can connect via the database, uh, you know, latency-wise and, and whatnot, and just availability-wise, it, it's wise to run that on the same machine, uh, but by no means do you have to. Um, a little more about the nodes themselves. It corresponds to a specific logical database instance. It's basically just a mapping from a node ID to, to a name, a conceptual name, uh, and that's, that's purely for kind of organizational purposes. You know, you basically set everything up with the node IDs in order to dis, you know, describe the relation in the topology and uh, the source of the events and whatnot. Um, there are several tables that are relevant here. You have the SL node table, which defines all of the nodes in the cluster. So every, every node ha has its own copy of this. Uh, you have an event table, which basically queues up any of the events that are, are created for this particular node. Um, and then, you know, I don't mention it here, but you, then you have a, con a confirm table that basically writes who's able, you know, who's seen the event in question once it's done. Um, so any changes to the actual node configuration and whatnot are done uh, via the events, and that has its own event type. Um, Talked about paths already. That's basically the connection information. Um, I think with current versions of Sloney, the listens are created automatically, but they used to be important. Uh, okay, so Sloney sets are the next thing. We, we saw conceptually how those are kind of the groups of the tables. Uh, they're things that are replicated together. Each set has an origin node, which is the node ID master for that set. That's the only node in the cluster that you will be able to write to that set of tables with. Um, it's replicated together. That's stored at the SL set table in the Sloney schema. Um, while the tables themselves are stored in the SL table table, uh, those, those have a one-to-one -one node mapping as far as who, what, what set they belong to. So the tracked table is in only one set, and I provide some of the uh, options with Slonic for creating this. Um, and then you have subscriptions, and this is where you kind of describe actually what is done with the sets. So subscriptions are basically a mapping from sets to nodes. Uh, if a node subscribed to the set, it'll receive any data changes related to it. Uh, you have to be a listener to, to be a subscriber. But basically, the subscriptions themselves are what's replicated where. So if you have node one and node two, and in a three-node cluster, if node two is subscribed to set one for, from the first node, it'll get all the events. It'll propagate that data. So Sloney um, also allows cascaded subscriptions, which basically are when you use a um, non-direct route to get to the, the node, let's say. 
Uh, if you have a master and you have several, several slave nodes, then um, they can either all connect directly to the master or they can, you know, one can kind of daisy chain to the next and uh, that can come in handy. And one of my case studies, I kind of go over how we were able to utilize that, uh, that for a good purpose. So anyway, that's, uh, there's, there's some extra special syntax when setting that up. Uh, you have to just basically say that you want to forward the events because normally when events are propagated, um, they just by default will not be uh, sent and stored on that table on the other node. So this kind of serves to uh, have this work as like a dispatcher. Uh, a little bit more about the triggers. So when the table's added to a replication set, Sloney uh, installs what are known as the log or the deny tri triggers to the table. So uh, when that's subscribed, uh, it'll basically depend on what the role is. So if you have an origin node, it gets the log triggers. If you are part of a non-origin node, if you're, you're a listener, you're, you're, you end up with the deny triggers. And that's what prevents you from modifying the table data uh, itself on the other side. Um, this is also done when you subscribe. Uh, Sloney has checks in place to make sure that you have the exact same table data uh, in place on both sides of the system. So it can guarantee that, that all the systems are set up the same way and have the same data. Um, it does that with a truncate and a copy to initially do this. So uh, this is a little bit about how Sloney tracks changes. Uh, it takes ownership of the tracks tables, and on the origin node, it adds the triggers, uh, which will fire on insert, update, or delete. Uh, probably truncate, too. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it, can. it can. If it can, it does truncate if it uh, cannot, if that error tells all the actual users. OK. Yeah, so it can truncate if 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 it can these log triggers end up storing information about what row was affected. It, essentially, the, the key in question, it contains this tuple data and the current snapshot of the transactions that were in place at the, uh, the time of, the, of running, because that comes in useful when you're replaying that. Uh, on a subscriber node, uh, you, you have the deny access triggers, and that basically just does nothing. Uh, so it effectively aborts whatever action you were trying to do. The next case, and that, that way you can guarantee and know that your data is the same, and, and Sloney can take that for granted without having to do anything else. Um, applying changes, the node Sloan daemon listens for sync event notifications. Those are types of the SL event uh, types. Effectively, that'll go and, and look at the provider node, gather the data from the log table since the last applied sync event, and uh, pull any of the, the logged information across you know, once it applies that data, it'll confirm it on the remote node. And so this ensures that, that we have serial changes. So all of the changes that were done in the same transaction are applied at the same time on the, the uh, slide. So let's talk a little bit about Bacardo now. Uh, it's a standalone replication system. You can push changes from Postgres to Postgres or other databases. It's also trigger-based, it's asynchronous. Uh, it supports both master, slave, and multi-master types of replication. Uh, here's a brief anatomy of the Bacardo system. At the top, you have the master control process, the MCP. Uh, you have control processes, the CTL. You have kids, because uh, Bacardo can't get enough goat puns. Uh, and those handle the actual dirty work of the, the replication itself. So um, this is, of course, a brief overview. You can see an example here for the red uh, sync. We've got, uh, uh, that's a, a multi-master kind of sync, so the data is flowing both ways. We've got a, for, for the blue sync, we've got the one-way data transfer. So the kid handles the, the actual propagation of the data. The controller makes sure the kid's around forks and when there's changes needed, et cetera. And the master control process just runs everything and makes, everything, makes sure everything's great. And we've got the Bacardo uh, command line process there, which is your primary point of, of uh, interface with the Bacardo system. So a little history about Bacardo. Uh, it was developed at Endpoint. It was started at backcountry.com in 2002 using Postgres 7.2. It was released publicly in 2007, so I think that's, what, uh, eight years old at this point. Uh, we're up to Bacardo 5, which just has true multi-master. Previous version had had just dual master. Uh, there's lots and lots of improvements over the previous versions. Uh, 
Some of the strengths of Bicardo include low requirements. You've got Postgres 8.3 is the minimum, PL Perlu, DBDPG. Uh, no changes needed for Postgres or its configuration. There's one daemon process which connects to all the databases in question. Uh, it can be run anywhere as long as it can connect everywhere. It's fast. It handles poor connectivity well, which is very handy a lot of times. So you can have situations where uh, if, if a connection goes down for a while, once it comes back, it'll automatically reconnect and uh, start the, the replication process again. Uh, it has good command line monitoring. All, all of the uh, configuration and, and monitoring for the most part is done with the Bicardo program itself. And it, there's an easy install setup process. So. More strengths, uh, depending on how you look at it. Targets, slaves are not locked, which means that you can write data to those things. Now that is gonna come in handy. Uh, also, the configuration is in the database. We also allow custom code, such as conflict handlers, data transforms, et cetera, so you can uh, replicate different data than is actually changed. You can do you know, custom aggregates to get pushed out to another server uh, if you have you know, reporting things that need to be done, so that can come in handy. Uh, there's multiple target types, Oracle, MySQL, Mongo. Um, this is an interesting difference here. Uh, in terms of Sloney, if you make, let's say, 100 changes to the same row between sync runs, it's gonna queue up 100 events, uh, which based on its design, it should do. In the case of Bacardo's design, if there's multiple changes to that same row, we only mark that once. We store the primary key only, and we don't care about the interim states. We basically say the final state of the row is what's interesting. Um, I think I touch on this more later. But uh, Bicardo itself is good for heterogeneous environments, so multiple database systems. If you have a, a legacy system that's, that's running Oracle and you've, you know, in the middle of a Postgres migration, you can push things across. Um, so there's, there's lots of benefits there. Uh, of course, it comes with its own set of limitations. There's no automatic handling of, of DDL. There's no built-in failover. Bicardo considers that outside of its domain. So uh, in the sense of, of multi-master, if you have one master, it's, it's up to you to kind of deal with how that's handled. Are you writing to both databases? Are you writing to just one of them? So it, it leaves that convention up to you. Um, of course, it requires primary keys for most of the, the syncs, which I honestly should not be a limitation, but it's just good design philosophy. Uh, again, the target slaves are not locked, which could be a strength, could, not, could be a weakness. So if you want to ensure that the data has not been changed, Bicardo does not give you that guarantee because that considers it out of its purview. And again, it replicates only the final state of affected rows. Uh, so for instance, if you had uh, some triggers that were supposed to log on every change, such as audit triggers, you know, Sloney would be a better choice in that situation because it's going to uh, make every change, you know, run the triggers that are, that are needed on that side, um, whereas Bicardo would just run it once with the final state of the row if it was not keeping up to date. So a little bit about Bicardo's fairly peculiar nomenclature. We call tables or sequences goats. Uh, you have the named group of goats. This is kind of the Sloney set. This is a, a herd, because what else would you call a group of goats? And then you have sync, uh, which basically specifies how the, the kind of data is replicated and how. And this is, is similar to um, the, the subscription uh, in Sloney. Uh, as I touched on in the diagram, we have the Bicardo architecture. We have the master control process, which runs and monitors everything. We have the controller process. It's spawned by the master control process. It's responsible for essentially listening for any, any changes in replication state and handling monitoring kid processes. And then the, the kids are themselves workers that uh, do the actual um, replication. I just can't get enough goat pens, like I said, with the kid. Uh, so the primary point of in, uh, interface with the Bicardo system is through the command line program. This used to be called Bicardo control, which I think makes it a lot less confusing in this talk because we say Bicardo, we're kind of referring to the entire system or uh, the daemon itself or the command line program. So I apologize for that. Uh, that lets you do such things as install and set up the database, uh, the Bicardo system, uh, add any of the objects, teach it about databases, teach it about uh, the herds, teach it about any of the, the, the syncs that you want to do, query for status, kick off a specific sync, and it has lots of good built-in help. Um, 
probably one of these days I'll do a demo, a live demo with things because I feel lucky. But, uh, the Bacardo configuration itself is stored in a special database. It's Bacardo. It just keeps, instead of uh, trying to keep anything in a config file, it just stores it all in the database, which has lots of uh, validations and triggers and whatnot, so it ensures that everything is, is set up properly. Uh, quite a bit of but the Bacardo system lives in its database. So it keeps track of the databases, the tables, the herds, sinks, settings uh, in its own database, which has to be owned by a Bacardo super user. Uh, this is all set up for you automatically via Bacardo install. You pass it a DSN uh, via the command line when you do that. And it uh, basically is able to store state about the Bacardo daemon itself, all the sinks. It's essentially its own metadata database. So how Bacardo tracks changes through its system is, again, with, with triggers. Um, whenever an insert, update, or delete is done, the primary key of the table is logged in what's known as the delta table, which lives in a Bacardo schema uh, on the, the target database. Uh, so the, it doesn't matter if it's an insert, update, or delete. If it's a delete, it, the only thing that's logged essentially, along with timestamp and whatnot, uh, it, it's not logging the actual table data. It's only logging the primary key. Uh, this can, depending on your sync settings, trigger notification that data's changed. And then Picardo will, will go ahead and start processing and applying the changes. Uh, when Picardo runs syncs, uh, either automatically or manually kicked, it checks the delta tables for all affected PKs. It then deletes them on the target, and then it copies the current row if, in case of any deletes. So this handles cases like if you delete it, then it's not going to exist in the target table. So when it tries to do an insert, uh, it's not going to have a source row for that. And uh, it basically handles things all itself. But it, it does that in batch, kind of as I have described with the, any changes that were done. Uh, Bacardo is, of course, multi-master. That was one of its original development purposes. Uh, Bacardo 5 has true multi-master using a round-robin syncing approach. Uh, every master in the cluster logs change rows by PK into a custom table. Uh, of course, when you have multi-master, you have the potential that multiple people have changed the same row at the same time in, in non-compatible ways. So as part of the, the application process, Bacardo checks to see if there's any conflicts. Um, there are different handlers that you can define for a specific sync that will tell Bacardo how it should handle these things. Uh, basically, any conflict is, is a bad situation. We have to figure out what's the right thing to do. So Bacardo has some standard conflict resolution methods. There's the source, the target, the random, or the latest, uh, which basically uh, source means that uh, the, the originating database, the, the, the current master, basically uh, wins no matter what. The, the target is the opposite, where the remote master wins. You could randomly do that, which I'm not sure that that's a good idea, but apparently it exists. And uh, there's the latest. Uh, where the timestamp uh, one that was changed last, you know, is, is the up-to-date version. And also, we allow you to, to write your own custom conflict resolution. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about BDR. Um, it's the new kid on the block, which I had a picture of Donnie up here, but couldn't figure it out. Uh, it's the bidirectional replication. It works via the logical log streaming features of Postgres. I'm not really covering it extensively because I know there's a talk following me. It seems pretty cool, but this looks like a very nice feature for Postgres to have, especially in core. Um, some of the strengths here is that it doesn't use triggers, uh, so it's able to, to avoid write magnification. It handles DDL modifications automatically for, for many cases, such as you know, table structure changes and whatnot. New tables are automatically replicated by default. They're added as, as they get put in. Uh, the current limitations of BDR is, of course, it requires a custom patch Postgres install. Uh, this, their goal is to get it into core, uh, which I would expect probably 9.6 realistically, but we'll see. Uh, some of the, the other limitations are that certain DDL features are currently restricted in the, the version that's out there now. And of course, it only works on Postgres greater than or equal to 9.4. Uh, you also have some limited control on cl cluster topologies, so it's not as nice as, uh, say, with Sloney or Picardo in that regard. 
Um, I'm probably going to skim through this particular section. I didn't realize it was going to go longer. I felt I was going to go short. But uh, we've got the side-by-side -side overview here of how you'd accomplish similar tasks with Sloney and Bacardo. So constructing the cluster uh, with Sloney, you basically can use the Slonix scripts to have a uh, turn your config file into the cluster. It sends out an init cluster. Uh, using the node configuration and the IDs that you've done creates all of the paths and listens and basically connects to all the databases and, and uh, initializes everything. Uh, for the purposes of Bacardo, you would use the Bacardo to, tool to uh, run the install process. Then you add the database names with various options. I think this slide is actually inaccurate for Bacardo 5 because I think we did away with DB groups. But uh, basically, you would define the herds. You would define the, the um, sets of tables that should be replicated where and when. Um, here's the syntax for specifying the replication groups within Sloney. You basically create a set with the, the defined tables here. You add them together. Uh, this is the syntax here for, with the Picardo control program to, to do the same. Um, you can modify the existing replication sets within Sloney. If you have to, let's say, add a new table and you want it to be in the same replication set, you have to create a set, a new set uh, with its own ID, subscribe that set to the same uh, providers as the original set, and then merge the set together. But that's able to do that uh, atomically. You've got uh, Bacardo, where you basically just use Bacardo itself to modify the sync definition, or you can. Um, also, I believe, modify it in the Bicardo database directly if you want to. Um, a little bit about the logging differences. I guess I've already covered this. Uh, Sloney itself logs the full row data because it needs to do that in order to, to replay those changes, uh, whereas Bicardo just logs the primary key and is only concerned with the final state. Uh, if you need to apply DDL changes to a Sloney cluster, you create a SQL script to make those changes for you, and then there's a uh, Slonic function or uh, command called execute script, which basically will coordinate that, the running of that uh, across all of the origin nodes to make, or all, across all the nodes in the cluster just to set everything up and make sure that it runs at the proper time. Uh, anything generated before or after will have the right log data structure. For instance, if, you, if you're logging, uh, changes to a table and then the table changes, you know, you can't replay that change in uh, the, the structure change until you've redone all the events that re require the old table structure. So uh, with DDL, with Picardo, it's a little messier. You can stop the replication, then make DDL changes manually, and restart the re replication. It's also smart enough though, if you want to do something like a simple column addition or drop uh, you just do that in a specific order uh, because it effectively does a select star from the this tables in question. If you add the column to the slave first, uh, then, then it'll still be replicating the old data correctly, and uh, then you can add that column on the master. But in general, it's better just to start and stop the replication yourself uh, if you can afford that. Uh, failover, Sloney has formal failover, uh, but move set is their preferred method. That switches the origin node from one particular node to another. Uh, it does this in such a way that the entire cluster is sane. Uh, so for instance, if you have a missing node that goes down, uh, it ensures that those events are, are in the proper order and properly acknowledged by everyone. Uh, if you have to, uh, if there's a failover command that'll forcibly remove the node from the cluster by contacting every other node except for the target one. And uh, that's basically something you only want to do if there's like no hope at all. So, uh, Bacardo itself has, of course, has no formal failover, but it does have the, uh, um, the deltas that, that continue collecting if you have, uh, you know, one of your masters go down the other masters will still be queuing up their changes, and then when it comes back, it'll notice that, restart the sync, and uh, make sure that it runs you know, whatever conflict handling it needs to. Uh, some monitoring with Sloney. There's the SL status view, which returns just information about every node in the cluster from the perspective of the node that you run that on. So it'll show you the number of events you lagged. It'll show you the time 
since it's been you know, applied, this can actually be out of sync within the cluster. So one node could be lagging behind relative to the other ones, but everyone else sees everything fine. Uh, so that's essential for debugging and monitoring things. Uh, Bacardo provides similar information through the Bacardo status, which you know, will show all the syncs and any lag and, and errors that are, it's encountered. Um, Sloney, of course, you know, wants to try to stay up to speed and replicate things as quickly as possible, which is the general case for most things. Uh, Bacardo lets you kind of change how that approach is done. You can have more or less immediate syncs where basically when there's a change that's made, it will kick off the sync for you. Uh, you can also have it be a timed process or a manual process where let's say you have um, table data that, that you don't care, it needs to only be like every 15 minutes uh, or something, you, know, some, you have some business use case, so you can set up the sync for that specific table, so that only runs, all of these tables can, can all, all of the syncs, excuse me, can have uh, their own policies with that, so you could have some getting kicked immediately, you could have some you know, every five minutes, some every 10 minutes, you, you can kind of customize the necessary behavior there. Uh, All right, I feel we're not gonna have a lot of time to get into the case studies, but uh, the, the short answer here, the talk's called choosing a logical replication system, and so of course there's no right answer. You have to kind of pick the scenario depending on the strengths of what you need and pick the right tool for the job. Um, we do have an example here which I think dates this specific one about a minimal downtime upgrade. We had uh, Postgres 8.2 uh, with Sloney, I can't remember, but it was one point something uh, in a four node cluster with one master, three slaves, and it wanted to upgrade to the shiny new Postgres 9.0 hot standby. So what we ended up doing, uh, because unfortunately the, the version of Sloan we had didn't support Postgres 9, we couldn't modify the cluster, we couldn't update anything, and we had all those pesky app servers that they wanted to keep around for some reason. Uh, this was a client where there was no downtime maintenance opportunity uh, so what we actually ended up doing was using Picardo to replicate the Sloney cluster to a hot standby cluster that was set up on the other data center. So that was actually three types of replication being used in the same way. You can actually run Picardo and Sloney on the same system uh, and, and that works fine. Um, so basically we, we had you know very simple schema but very large table, lots of changes going on. We had to main, make sure that this all, all happened. Um, but using Picardo, we were able to kind of have the application downtime itself be measured in minutes regardless of the size of the database. So this was a large database. Um, we ended up creating the new Postgres cluster with the hot standby stream replication just on its own, kind of an empty uh, replication cluster. We tested everything on that side, uh, created the schema on the other side, and then basically installed Picardo on the new system. So we made sure that we were collecting the deltas in the Bicardo tables. Uh, so at that point, we could then do a Postgres dump, PG dump, uh, everything still getting captured in this time, so we was able to load that. And then we were able to start Bicardo up, have the replication run, be able to copy any tables uh, or records that had changed in this table over. Uh, essentially, so we were able to kind of take this approach using Bicardo, get things going, updated, and working on the Postgres 9. Uh, and then once we were done and tested everything, we just removed Bacardo from the equation and they had their new setup. Um, I don't have enough time, I think, to go into this, this other data center migration, but effectively what it was was a, a Sloney cluster that we had to go across a very um, expensive and error-prone VPN uh, with a huge database that took you know, 14 hours to subscribe. Uh, so we were able to minimize that by using the, the cascaded subscription to set that up, do the replication once over the expensive link, and then do the other subscribes over to the other nodes on that side from there. So um, I guess at this point, that's about all I have. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. We've got a couple minutes maybe, but uh, thank you very much. Anybody? All right, who wants the Red Bull? Okay, thank you.